everyone and welcome to this week's Squiggly Career Podcast. I'm Sarah, one of the co-founders of Amazing If, and I'm here with Helen, one of my other co-founders. Hello. And after last week's career Q&A episode, which was a bit of a hiatus, which I hope you all enjoyed, we're back today with our usual focus, helping everyone who's listening develop the skills that we all need to succeed in our squiggly careers and squiggly worlds. Um, so just as a quick reminder, Helen, how has your squiggly career been this week so far? How's it all going? Uh, honestly? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, rather than lying, well, I, mean, I honest, would guess. Honest. Uh, so uh, honestly, so my squiggly career is probably um, made up of, I think what's u- maybe unique to me is that I have so many different uh, projects going on. So mm-hmm. squiggly careers, loads of opportunities. I seem to grab everyone because I have an inability to say no and get excited about lots of things and they have all been spinning at full speed this week so um that, you know I obviously work for Microsoft and um, we're doing planning at the moment for next year so that's kind of going on in the, kind of my my day job uh, I'm doing my coaching qualification at the moment as part of my kind of exploring career possibilities for the future um so I have been trying to submit my assignments which are a little Ooh. bit late <laughs> so so it's oh, kind of no. doing that. Well, yeah, but my my uh, the person that marks them is away this week, so I've basically got a leave oh, okay. for a few days. So it's all good. So it's all good. Uh, late, but not in trouble. Uh, and then also, <laughs> I've been writing a proposal for us for an interesting but a bit secret project. Um, so yeah, very I would say extra squiggly this week. I need another bank holiday to rest and create some more magic time. What What about you? Um, I was actually thinking about this. The start of my weeks don't tend to be as squiggly because I work in one job as managing director for a creative agency and my Monday to Wednesdays are very much immersed in that world. And actually, if you asked me what I'd done in the last three days, you know, and you just think I've been incredibly busy, which I always think is a real cop out to just say I'm really busy. But I've got that slight feeling of where I actually can't remember a single thing that I've done. (laughs) No, I definitely have done a lot of stuff. I, I'm convinced of it. <laughs> but you know, when it becomes, you've done so many different things, and I love the variety in my job, that actually, sometimes you have got to pause and stop and reflect. And what I always try to do within those first three days of my week, because I know they're always going to be really full on, lots of different things happening, is to have some injection of squiggliness in some way. Because I really enjoy the squiggliness of my career and the different things that I do. And my squiggly injection for this week has been reading a book called Alive at Work, which is by Dan Cable. Um, Really easy to read on the train. I have a train commute twice a day that I can spend some time doing that. And I've also discovered a new podcast, which is called um, The Inspiring Leader Podcast. It's done by um, somebody actually we both know called Andy Bird. And if you just search Inspiring Leader or Andy Bird, he does it in conjunction with the Marketing Society, you'll find that it comes up. And he's interviewed some really fascinating people. Uh, Martha Lane Fox, one of the founders of LastMinute.com. Pip Jamieson, one of the founders of The Dots. And they sort of tell their stories in terms of leadership, what they've learned. Really short, they're about 15 minutes. Um, They're really good listens. They're really good insight into different people's kind of leadership styles what you know preferences the interesting businesses so um i definitely recommend both of those oh i love that right added i found another one today i think it's called good work but i need to double check that but i, I quite like the idea obviously everyone listening listens to podcasts because they're listening to us so um we should definitely surface uh podcasts that we think are which are which are really good so uh, that is added yeah share your recommendations yes oh, that's added to to my list anyway um okay then well let's talk about today's topic and um, we'll get straight into that now so this was a suggestion that um i put on our instagram story so we do a daily if you're an Instagrammer. I don't know if that's the right term, but if you're on Instagram, we do uh, a daily Instagram stories, which is um, uh, a squiggly career tip every day. So it's, I don't know, two minutes of Instagram story to listen to every day. Um, And last week when I was doing one of them, I put um, a poll on there about should we do a podcast episode on how to manage your manager? Um, And I've done that previously like with like the stress podcast that we've done. And it's the first one that we've ever had that was like 100% of people, um, which is about, I don't know, it's about 50 people, 100% of those people said yes they wanted a podcast on how to manage your manager so we are listening and that is going to be the focus of the next 30 minutes and maybe before we share our experiences we should just talk a little bit about 
why is managing your manager going to help you in this kind of world of squiggly careers that Sarah and I talk about? Um, maybe Sarah, I'll, I'll hand over to you to answer that question. Having just put it out there. Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, so I, I think. Well, I think there's two things, and probably the reason that everybody voted for it is because it's relevant to all of us. Because even as careers are changing, and the squiggly world that we all talk about in terms of uh, what that enables around technology and ambiguity, most of us in reality certainly for the next few years, we'll have somebody that we work for. And what's probably going to happen for most of us is that actually we're going to work for way more people than perhaps people, uh, you know, the next generation above us would have worked for because you stayed in jobs for longer, you stayed in companies for longer. So actually the ability to manage a wide range of different people who are likely to be your managers, because they're also going to be having squiggly careers and moving on, is really important. And I think generally um, your manager is one of the single biggest indicators of how happy you are in your job. If you think about what you complain about, what you talk to your partner about, what makes you really happy in your job and what you kind of find meaning and purpose from, often your manager has a really big role to play in in terms of just your day-to-day effectiveness, how much you're enjoying what you're doing. Mm, Yeah. And I think we can all, um, I think you can recognise, can't you? You know, when you've had a, relationship that's not gone so well with your manager you just you know how you feel because everyone's had that experience you know you feel more anxious or stressed and you're just not doing your best work you know you could do better stuff but you're often not sure how to find your way through that and equally we know when it's felt really great so what we've tried to get to today is to share some of our experience and really focus on when it has worked really well what were we doing what action were we taking because I think this is about you taking control working out what you can do, uh, not kind of blaming a manager or putting it all on the manager and going, well, it's they're in that position, so they should just sort all this stuff out. This is about what, what can you do? Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think that you're not in control of your manager, but you're in control of you. Yeah. So focus on focus on that. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, actually. I want to talk about when it didn't work for me and I guess what right. I learned about that situation because it's just wasted effort trying to change a manager. Um, that, you know, they are what they are and they've got other stuff that they're dealing with, but how you react to that um, emotionally and how you respond to it with action, that is stuff that you are in control of. Um, and so I think I have been on a bit of a journey with that with yeah. my different experiences and managers that I think sets me up for success now whether they're you know a really good match for me or whether they're maybe uh you know not the person you would have picked basically (laughs) (laughs) um so shall I go first first. so I think what what I have learned maybe from a from a good situation about how to manage your manager and, and I guess something that I've noticed when I first started out in my career I think I was given more explicit direction from managers about what they wanted me to do because you know maybe I was more junior I needed that direction and that was a bit of a given that I would get that from managers but what I've noticed as I have got more senior and therefore my managers have got more senior is that I sometimes I've been hired for problems that they don't know how to solve that's why they've hired me yeah so Asking them to be really explicit and articulate about the job that they want me to do is almost unreasonable because they're sort of like, well, that's sort of what you're here for. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it's like. And it's sort of like broadly, that's why we brought you on board to define what you think the job is. And in that situation, expecting a manager to give you you know, a really clear set of objectives, as much as we'd like that, and we know that that's, that would be setting you up for success. The reality that I have found in probably the last... I don't know, six, seven years of my career, maybe even longer, is that no manager has been able to give me really, really crystal clear objectives in like a, I would like you to deliver this, these five things this year. But what I have done instead is uh, instead of asking, you know, what do you expect me to deliver? I have instead asked them, what does good like look like for you, for me in this role? And that seems to have opened up a better conversation for them. So like I can say to my manager now, his name is Scott. He is thankfully a very good manager. Um, but I could say to him... <laughs> when you were uh, name dropping then, I was like, oh, yeah, that is a dangerous yeah. game. No, no genuinely. He, I, he, I bet, I bet he's ones. really good. <laughs> <laughs> he is, he is. But um, I could say to Scott, Scott, what does good look like to you for me in my role in the next you know, quarter is the way that we talk. But I could say, 
in the next year and then I could understand that a little bit so he might say Helen good looks like to me you've got um your team have got really clear direction they're motivated your stakeholders are on board and I could take that and then I could use that to create my objectives and play that back to him so rather than you know expecting him to do that work for me because there's definitely something about managing your manager about making their life a bit easier I could take that, okay, that's what good looks like to him or her, whoever it would be for you, and then break that down into a set of deliverables that you think you would need to do to achieve that and then play that back to them. By doing that, I feel like I maybe get the clarity that I need so I can align it with them. I've made their life a bit easier because I've just sort of asked them to imagine some future vision of where where what I've done is good. And that seems to yeah. be an easier thing for a manager to answer. And so it sort of it it, it meets their needs. It gives me the clarity and it, it takes the work away from them. And I found that found that really useful in my jobs at Microsoft. And that's a kind of a big organization with a busy manager who's got lots on. Found it really useful to do it that way in my job in Virgin. And that was a smaller team, but we were going at such pace because it was a startup. Um, so I, I would highly recommend that if you're lacking any clarity about what a manager wants you to do and you're thinking, oh, I need to understand their expectations, just that, look, what does good look like to you question is a really good starting point that you can then build the answer on. Yeah. And I think, you know, as you were talking, you were saying, you know, often managers find it difficult to be crystal clear in terms of what they want from you. It made me think, oh, should should managers be able to do that? Because that's obviously an important skill set in terms of objectives. But I wonder whether increasingly, because of the squiggliness that we talk a lot about, the ability to be really definitive is probably getting harder. Because you're right, I've had certain jobs where it's very clear what's expected of you. But those were jobs that didn't have as much variety in or um, perhaps existed in more hierarchical structures that we're seeing less of. So actually, that ability to define for yourself what good looks like and to make that really clear with your manager will probably only become more important, I guess. Yeah, I think it's an op- again with the whole thing with squiggly careers. It's an opportunity if you know how to do it. Yes, it feels really scary when you don't. So thinking, oh my god, I've got to define what great looks like in my job myself and go back with that that can feel a bit daunting or you can think well brilliant I get to shape this I get to craft my role I get to use all of my strengths to the best of my ability in this role so it can create the most value so I think it is a bit of a mindset shift but also it's making your boss's life easy um you know and they've still got a job to do don't take the job away from them but I think packaging things up for them so that they can critique it sign it off comment on it rather than expecting them to do all the upfront work is definitely something that I have had to do as my managers have got more senior and you know to use that word busy that you know they've their time has been spread across more things (laughs) packaging up for them to do that has been much more effective for me yeah So what about you? Come on, one, one of yours. Um, so slightly different. I think one of the things that I found most effective is to spend quite a lot of time trying to understand my manager's world and their motivations. So really trying to walk in my manager's shoes, so to speak, um, through having empathy for what it is that they're trying to do, that they're trying to achieve, what their challenges and motivations might be. And the way that I do that practically is wherever I can, I've always tried to volunteer for things like, um, can I deputise for you at a meeting? You know, if if they're ever away on holiday or or they've just got a lot on in a week and need somebody to go to a meeting on their behalf, volunteering to do that. And, you know, the expectations are usually quite low in those meetings because people don't expect you to know all the answers. So it's quite a useful way to get an insight into some of the conversations or things that might be happening that you don't usually see. Can you shadow your manager? for a day or for a week or just really simply ask them what's on their mind at the moment you know what's top of their list of things that they're worried about what keeps them awake at night because that idea of understanding first and then expecting to be understood I have found incredibly powerful because you are essentially Mm. starting from someone else's world and not from your own world and you're remembering and acknowledging that being a manager at is is really hard. I think sometimes we have this perception of like managers are, you know, they've got this, maybe they're perfect or it's brilliant. I don't know, they all get paid loads of money or whatever it might be. But actually it can be really tough. You know, it can be lonely. It can be frustrating. There's probably things going on that they have to deal with that are 
really tough and they may they may be not able to talk about. And so I think if you can demonstrate to your manager you're on their side, you know, you want to you want to work as a team, you want to be supportive, then actually that I think really helps you to develop a relationship with your manager, which is essentially what you're trying to do. And a really high level of trust, I think a deeper level of trust than maybe you'd have otherwise. And somehow then that just helps you to manage that relationship I've always found in in a really effective way and I think I'm just listening to you and thinking about you as a person as well Sarah this is like live feedback for you oh great I I think just just what I need at 9.40 on a Wednesday night (laughs) some live feedback (laughs) but I, I, I was just thinking about that building that relationship so I definitely agree that finding a way to build that relationship is key and that you want to do that authentically so if I think about you it would be very authentic to you because you are a caring person and you uh, want to thanks. understand what was going on with people. It'd be a very authentic way for you to build a relationship with a manager to base it on those sorts of conversations. If I think about my peers that I've had in relationships that they might have built with my managers in the past, they might have done it on a like, almost like a social basis, a banter right. basis. And they, they've also had a really strong relationship with their manager, but it's been more authentic to them. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm not the banter person. I'm, I'm very similar to you. I would want to understand what's on your mind. How can I help? How do you know what are your priorities? I, they would be the questions that I'm answering. But I have seen other people manage a manager really well in a very different style. It's just been a more yes. authentic to them to do it in that way. So I think find that authentic way of connecting with somebody that you would do probably whether they're a manager or not, but use that to build the relationship. Definitely. And so you mentioned where it doesn't work before, um, yeah. like some, yeah. some experiences you've had where it's not been quite so good. So when's that happened and kind of what did you do? What would you do differently in hindsight? You, know, you have to be careful here about when it's happened, don't you? With oh, yeah. Like, n- naming it. Perhaps, yeah. Um, there's no, there's no naming and shaming here because <laughs> let's face it, we we have both been managers for over ten years now, and I we both take this stuff so seriously, and there is no way we get it right all the time. You know, I could think of examples in the last month where I haven't got it right. So it's not about yeah, not about being okay. perfect. It's being you know trying your best. <laughs> So there have been situations in my career where I think, do you know, I could have managed the manager better and I've learned some things from it. Um, but some of some of what I've learned actually is, has been that when the management relationship isn't great, it's not always about you. So if I think about situations I've had with some managers where despite me trying to build a relationship, um, to your point, and despite, despite me trying to define what good looks like in developing a plan, the point that I raised earlier, it still hasn't worked. Right. Um, it has been a difficult, stressful relationship mm-hmm. that has caused me challenge. And when I, when I reflect on what I didn't do well and how I changed so that it made it better. I think how I reacted to some of that stuff originally, which I wouldn't recommend doing, is I got quite emotional right. about it. I got quite frustrated. You know, we were talking earlier about I tried to change my manager and <laughs> also tried, sort of tried to change myself a little bit. I was like, how can I try a different approach? Maybe I will have a meeting with them or I'll email them or I'll try this approach or... And then, and then I would just get frustrated that it was all that they were all wrong, and it, it just created quite a lot of emotion in the situation. And after actually a bit of coaching with somebody, which gave me a bit of perspective, I realised that it was what it was. You know, we had a different style. Ultimately, they, they may be more autocratic than I was. I'm a, quite a collaborative person. I like lots of freedom. Don't really you know it's not my natural style to connect with lots of autocratic people um but that was what I had and they weren't going to change that was their style this was my style so the best thing that I could do was to take the emotion out of it that was not serving that relationship well at all it was creating unnecessary friction stop almost criticizing them for being who they were that was just who they were (laughs) I didn't have to agree with it but it was just their approach they probably didn't agree with my approach but taking the emotion out of that made that easier and sort of accepting it being a bit more transactional in the relationship. So not expecting that person to have really deep conversations with me about where my career is going and come up with ideas with me. They weren't, they weren't that. And I had to just accept that. So be a bit more transactional um, with them, take the emotion out. I think reflect a little bit on what that means for you. So, Oh, this has really bothered me that they don't care about my development. Um, Yeah. Is that something that I could like self-serve, if you know what I mean? Why am I always looking to my manager to help me with that? Is that an insight that I can have with me? But I do think there comes to a point where 
you have to just accept this isn't all about you. This is about who they are, how they approach things. And um, you, you need to work with that rather than um, trying to change it. If you have that situation with a manager where you're just not connecting, I would say don't look to them for validation. I've definitely I've seen this in other people that I have mentored before when they're like, oh, my manager doesn't give me support or encouragement. And I think when it's like that that might be more about the manager's style and you you know if you're in a situation you can give them feedback then great but ultimately they might they just might not value that stuff yeah but it is an opportunity to, again to look into yourself and say why do to be successful why do i need to have that from my manager or can't i get that from some other source so a bit of a waffly answer but i think my, my core kind of tips are if if you feel like i cannot connect meaningfully with this manager I would say take the emotion out don't don't dislike them for being who they are um but be a bit more transactional these are the three things that I'm doing this quarter is that okay with you fine okay I'll deliver this and this get to like that with them and don't expect to have the deep meaningful conversations about your values and things that's just not who they are and hopefully you'll have your next manager who might be like that um but don't you know don't try and change what it is I suppose we often talk about um don't your job doesn't need to provide everything that you're looking for from your career as in one job doesn't need to provide everything and it's a similar concept with managers your one manager doesn't need to give you everything all of the time Mm -hmm. and I think just being just being open to that I think can be really useful so I think my final thing as well is getting perspective if you're in that situation because you spend so much time with a manager um it can feel really hard because they're so important to your role so I think getting some perspective from a mentor or a peer or a coach whatever you can access is um is a really helpful thing I think in in that situation yeah and actually mine my um, example of where things haven't gone so well is an interesting build on yours because actually I found that at times I've tried to probably impose my own style too much on a manager without accepting that people work in different ways and that it is okay to be creative and adaptable about how to manage your manager. So even though there are some things that I think are really important as a manager, that doesn't, like you say, that doesn't necessarily translate into kind of everybody else and people have different ways of working, different ways of communicating. Um, and rather than just getting frustrated or a bit worked up by those things, I, I, I've i actually found I've been much more successful where I've been prepared to be flexible in my own style. So that doesn't mean that I'm jeopardising the things that I really believe in. I'm just, I think, being smart about the fact if I've got a manager who isn't great at responding to emails, okay, is that just not their preferred method of communication? Are they actually really good in person? Are they more structured as people in terms of how they like to spend their time? Or actually, do they really like a spontaneous chat? And I think it kind of goes back to the putting yourself in other people's shoes. But if you can be smart, I think, about observing when is your manager at their best? Mm. When do you when do you get the most value from them? When do they have the most impact? And then how can you put yourself into those situations? Um, I remember a few years ago, I worked for uh, a brilliant leader, actually, who we used to meet once a week early on a Tuesday morning at a coffee shop. And it was before a regular meeting that we had every week. And she was very senior. And if I'd have spent lots of time emailing her or writing presentations, she would never have had time to look at them. And, and actually, I'm naturally quite structured. So that does quite appeal to me to do those things. But I could meet with her once a week in person and just use that as an opportunity to share some thoughts or ideas or wanted to get feedback on various different things. And it was the best way to build a relationship because it gave us the opportunity to meet in an environment and context that really worked for her. It worked for me because once I knew I had that, I could prepare and go and use that time in a really um, relevant way to my role. And it meant that I could I could be loads better at my job as a result. And that was me being just a bit flexible in terms of going, OK, something the outputs don't always have to look exactly the same. You you can be a bit more flexible. I love that idea. I'm also quite jealous. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. It was. I used to really, enjoy, I really, really enjoyed that. So, uh, Sarah, if you're listening, I absolutely loved our uh, morning sessions in the coffee shop called Sacred. <laughs> best best day ever. <laughs> I used to love it. Should we talk about some resources that might be useful for yes. everybody? Yes. Um, so there is a few. Now, this first one is going to be embarrassing because I don't know how to pronounce the guy's surname. So um, <laughs> there's a really brilliant philosopher called Roman Krasnarik. Um, Krasnarik? 
Krisner it? Yes. I mean, that's, <laughs> it sounds better than what I just said. We'll a, send the link. <laughs> we'll send the link. Um, a, he's brilliant. He's written some um, amazing uh, thinking. He's done some amazing thinking and written some really good books on work generally. But he's done a lot of work more recently on empathy. So he did something called the Empathy Museum. So you can watch his TED Talks, read his books. He's done lots of writing online. So definitely have a look at some of the things that he's he's written. There's one particular uh, article called The Six Habits of Highly Empathetic People um, that's really good that we'll, we'll send the link out to. So that's the first one. The uh, second one that I discovered, so there's some really good um, YouTube videos on the science of influence that I think were produced by a couple of guys who've actually written a book on the topic. But they're those, um, you know, those really nice illustrated videos yeah, where a hand comes on screen. And I was like, I find that fascinating to just watch. Um, but I also find it a really useful way to actually remember the content. And it takes about five minutes versus reading the book. Um, so we'll tweet the link to that. But that's um, a really good illustrated video to watch. And then the last one, which you discovered and shared with me today, which looks really good, which I've not had a chance to have a look at yet, is the Drucker Institute. So they do lots of content targeted at kind of work and leadership. And they specifically have some content on senior leaders sharing their examples of how they manage their managers. So if you found it useful today to hear us talking about our experiences and you'd like to get more variety, more breadth of different people kind of uh, talking about their stories, what's worked and what hasn't, um, definitely have a look at that. Yeah, and the article's called Managing the Boss. So if you're, if you're The Boss. Searching, is it Ameri- that's American, isn't it? Is that American? Yeah, I think... Oh, I think the boss. Drucker Institute, I think, is based somewhere in Europe. But yeah, The Boss, the boss right. sounds very, very, uh, very yes. American. Yes. Um, okay brilliant so uh, let's let's wrap up here then hopefully that's been a couple of useful resources and as sarah said i'm getting a bit better at sharing things we are doing a <laughs> work in progress update, a work in progress we're doing an update to our website so when that all goes live we will have all of the podcasts listed on our website and for each episode we'll put the links in there so bear with us while we're getting all that all that sorted in the meantime whether you find us on linkedin or whether you follow us on twitter at amazing underscore if or amazing if on Instagram in all of those places I'm putting the links uh, podcasts go live on a Tuesday so you can find us and the links there on those days so just bear with us while we sort it out um, so yeah so that's it for today next week we are doing another kind of deep dive into a theme and we're doing one all around new jobs so we've done a podcast previously on the best ways of getting a new job. This one's slightly different. This is about when you've got that new job, how do you succeed in, you know, the first 90 days, the first 100 days, whatever that kind of marker is that is in, in your mind. So you we'll know, talk I was just about... thinking, we Go talked on. about the fact that we're doing this next week and I've just realised I've literally just hit that 100-day mark in my new job. Ah, so, you know, I should probably give okay. some thought to what works and what hasn't. <laughs> Uh, maybe I should have like the five things you should do to succeed in your new job and I'll be like Sarah have you done that (laughs) oh yeah yeah let's do that you come up with what you think and I will talk through whether I think I've done a good job of them or not you do realize if you've not if you've not done those things then that might not be the most uh brilliant outcome to the that's podcast. okay that's okay they've been, <laughs> okay you know they've employed me now okay there you go <laughs> probation period sarah no no oh never actually mind. yeah that's true <laughs> never mind i'm sure it'll be fine they, listen, everyone seems pretty happy i'm sure it's fine now i'm actually week. really worried <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen next week to see how that conversation goes brilliant um, but uh, in the meantime if you have got any other topics that you would like us to cover or any feedback on on, on this episode or other ones that you've heard and as well just get in touch with us we love hearing from people it yeah we is, really do i love the messages we get on instagram and the emails that we get so um i'll just repeat it all so you can get in touch with us on um on twitter we are amazing underscore if on instagram we're just amazing if and that's where we do our daily instagram stories where we do the daily career tips uh on linkedin it's helen tupper and sarah ellis or you can just email us that sounds a bit retro now doesn't it but um, yeah. you can ju- you can just email us um at get in touch at amazingif.com and we read we reply and we use all of the stuff that you share with us to improve what we're doing um so that is it for today and we will speak to you very soon bye thanks very much everybody bye